Thanks very much for everyone for coming. Uh, it's brilliant to see so many people here. Um, our first guest, Francesca Albanese, was appointed the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territories Occupied since 67 by the Human Rights Council at its 49th session in March 2022 and has taken up her function as of the 1st of May 2022. She is a lawyer by training, specialising in human rights. Albanese is an affiliate scholar at the Institute for the Study of International Migration at Georgetown University, as well as a senior advisor on migration and forced displacement for a think tank, Arab Renaissance for Democracy and Development. She has widely published on the legal situation in Israel, occupied Palestine and Palestinian refugees, and the state of Palestine, and regularly teaches and lectures on international law and forced displacement at universities in Europe and the Arab region. Ms. Albanese has also worked as a human rights expert for the United Nations, including the Office of the UN High Commission for Human Rights and the UN Relief and Work Agency for Palestine Refugees. In recent months, Francesca has been advised for international law. She has upheld her responsibilities and we believe she has been a credit to her mandate. Her report on the situation in Gaza, published a few weeks ago called Anatomy of a Genocide, is a harrowing but necessary read. It needs to be read by everybody and it needs to be read by everyone in these institutions where we have left so much to be desired for so long during this war. Francesca has shown incredible courage in speaking truth to power, a rare commodity these days. And we are honoured to welcome her and I give her the floor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm really... Uh, grateful to the left group in the European Parliament for inviting me. This is not the first time, but it's surely the time where I come with a heavier start to share with you what, I, what I've been working on over the past uh, six months. I am particularly grateful to parliamentarians that sit with me here today, Claire Daly, Manu Pineda, Mark Potenga and Mick Wallace, and also to the other wonderful speakers who will intervene after me, uh, Daniel Levy and Diana Butto. Um, it's, um, this, this past month uh, we have seen uh, the unrelenting Israeli assault on occupied Gaza. And um, I've noticed patterns that were not new, but inten that intensified and escalated Gaza had already suffered five wars over 16 years, which had caused six, um, sorry, 5,200 deaths, including 1,200 children. So the Palestinians in Gaza had already endured a lot. And still, nothing. While I expected violence to explode sooner or later, no one would expect what has happened on the 7th of October and, as of the 7th, and since the 7th of October. History teaches us that genocide is a process, is not an act. And it's not a word that I used with a, heavy, with a, with a light heart. And we know that genocide starts with the dehumanization of the other as a group and the denial of that group's humanity. And it ends with the destruction of the group in whole or in part. This is in history. The dehumanization of the Palestinians as a group is the hallmark of their history in Palestine for the past 25 years. It's a history of ethnic cleansing, dispossession, and apartheid. In the words of uh, the great Palestinian scholar and intellectual Edward Said, Palestinians were made orphans of a homeland 75 years ago by the creation of the State of Israel and its continuous policies which are undeniably intended to erase their presence from the land. Genocide is not defined by personal experiences, painful as that they can be. Genocide is not defined by personal opinions. Genocide is defined in international law as a specific set of acts 
committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, ra racial or religious group as such. It is often referred to as the crime of crimes because of its complexity and because of the challenges that exist in proving the specific intent that the Genocide Convention requires. But yet the complexity is not about the creation of a hierarchy between atrocity crimes. So there is no hierarchy between war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. They're simply different crimes. So there is a this is the, the way genocide is defined as the crime of crimes is a reflection of its different nature and scale, the destruction of a people in whole or in part. The heightened threshold that international law establishes for genocidal intent uh, must be proven directly or inferred from facts which admit no other reasonable inference. But when genocidal intent is so conspicuous, it's so ostentatious, as it has been in Gaza, as it has been toward the Palestinian people, and in Gaza particularly, over the past six months, we cannot avert our eyes. We must confront what it is, call it by its name. We should have prevented it, and we were not able to do so. Humanity has failed yet another people, after Rwanda, after Srebrenica, after Myanmar. But then genocide must be punished. After analyzing Israel's actions and patterns of violence uh, since the 8th of October, acts that have been underpinned by a dehumanizing rhetoric by high-ranking Israeli officials, both political and military, and often reflected in the soldiers' actions on the ground, I concluded that the threshold indicating Israel's commission of genocide had been met. Specifically, I concluded that Israel has committed three acts of genocide with the requisite intent, with the requisite intent killing members of the group, causing serious, serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, and deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. If you look at the harrowing number of deaths, the irreparable harm done to those who will survive, the systematic destruction of every aspect necessary to sustain life in Gaza, from hospital to schools, from bakeries to cultural centers, from homes to arable land, and the particular harm to hundreds of thousands of children and the pregnant women and young mothers. This can only be interpreted as constituting prima facie evidence of an intention to systematically destroy the Palestinian in Gaza as a group. In this assault on Gaza, which I said was the sixth and most egregious in 16 years, Israel has killed over 33,000 Palestinians, including more than now 14,000 children. Can we let it sink in? 14,000 children! More than the children killed in all conflicts worldwide in over four years prior to this. Journalists, doctors, nurses, artists, scientists, academics, engineers, and their family members, all been, they have all been targeted. A whole society has been targeted. Today, over 7,000 are presumed dead under the rubble. The Palestinians who remain in Gaza keep on talking of the stench in the air. Gaza is not just a graveyard. Gaza is the stench of death in the air. And there are 75,000 wounded, many with life-changing life -changing injuries, made worse by the decimation of the healthcare system. All hospitals have been destroyed, and the overwhelming unsanitary conditions created in Gaza over the past six months. 70% of the residential area have been destroyed, 70% of the homes, 80% of the whole population has been forcibly displaced. Thousands of families have lost loved ones who have been wiped out entirely, five generations. Many could not bury or mourn their relatives, forced instead to leave their bodies decomposing in homes, in the street, or under the rubble. 
Thousands of Palestinians have been also detained and systematically subjected to inhumane and degrading treatment. Two millions are today forced into hunger and starvation. In the first two weeks, Israel prevented all humanitarian aid from entering Gaza. And in, in the ensuing months, it has imposed extreme restrictions on water, food, electricity, and fuel. Israel has blocked the entry of medical supplies, such as anesthetics, incubators, and even baby formula and chocolate cookies, Convo because they are luxury goods, so they cannot, Gazans cannot be allowed to go to us. Convoys have hardly reached northern Gaza where 300,000 people are trapped with no way to escape. This deliberate policy has induced rapid and sustained severe food insecurity in the entire population, with those trapped in the north forced to eat animal feed and grass. The occupying power, Israel, has also undermined UNRWA, which is the main lifeline in Gaza. The reason why there was a World Central Kitchen delivering food, an NGO delivering food from the sea, to the Palestinians in Gaza is because 70% of the roads have been destroyed, UNRWA is not allowed to deliver anything, and Israel is not honoring its obligation under international law to take care of the occupied population. The hostages, the Israeli hostages and their families have certainly not escaped this devastating circumstances. The collective scars of all this are are going to last generations. The initial weeks of the assault, Israeli forces killed around 250 Palestinians a per day through an apocalyptic arsenal of weaponry, including from Europe, on one of the most densely populated places on Earth. 25,000 tons of explosives, equivalent to two nuclear bombs, unguarded munitions, and hundreds of 2,000 pounds Bunker buster were used to level entire neighborhood. This is how we got to this level of devastation. The ground offensive has changed the pattern, but not the scale of destruction. And in five months, Israel has, in six months, in fact, Israel has entirely destroyed Gaza, erasing or severely damaging almost all civilian infrastructure and agricultural land, most of the homes, healthcare facilities, telecommunication infrastructure, all universities, most educational facilities, about 300 all municipal services, mosques, churches, and innumerable, as I said, cultural heritage sites, which are integral to the memory, the history, the identity, and the social fabric of Palestine. The vehement anti-Palestinian discourse, which frames the entire Palestinian population in Gaza as enemies to be eradicated and forcibly removed, has been pervasive across all segments of the Israeli society call for violent annihilation from Israeli high-ranking officials with command authority aimed at soldiers on duty in the ground have served as compelling evidence of explicit and public encouragement to commit genocide. Israeli soldiers have published endless footage boasting about their killing of families, mothers, children, the bombing of homes, mosques, and schools. Self-incriminating videos show them sadistically mocking and humiliating their Palestinian victims, not only by the violating their physical integrity, their right to life, but also their dignity, their most inter intimate possession and spaces that they have entered and looted, and by desecrating cemeteries and places of worship. One of the key findings of my report is that Israel's executive and military leadership and soldiers have intentionally distorted foundational principles of international humanitarian law, like the principle of distinction between civilian um, and military objects, between civilians and combatants, the principle of proportionality in each military action, and the principle of precaution which is necessary in any attack in an attempt to legitimize genocidal violence against the Palestinian people. By deliberately redefining the categories of human shields, evacuation orders, warnings, safe zones, collateral damage, medical protection, Israel has used the, these protective functions, these principles, protective functions, as what I call humanitarian camouflage, with the effect of concealing patterns of conduct from which the only inference can, can, 
that can be reasonably drawn is a state policy of genocidal violence against the Palestinians. And blurring the distinctions between protected civilians or, or civilian infrastructure and combatants or legitimate military targets, Israel has effectively characterized the whole civilian population in Gaza as human shields, as terrorists, terrorist accomplices, as a matter of legal policy. This, you can find this in the legal documents that Israel has used to justify its military conduct. And those who managed to evacuate the areas that Israel defied, uh, to the areas that Israel defined as safe humanitarian zones have been met with further attacks. And uh, their deaths and injuries justified by Israel as collateral damage. So by making repeated claims that Hamas has used the hospital as operation centers, Israel has been operating on the premise that if you tell a lie long enough, you repeat it over and over, people will believe it. And some politicians do seem to believe it. Israel has used the camouflage of humanitarian law to um, characterize all civilians and all life-sustaining infrastructure in Gaza as targetable, killable, and destroyable. Israel has attempted to legitimize the devastation of Gaza's medical infrastructure, one of all, uh, which has led to potentially thousands of additional deaths, life-changing injuries, and trauma. Think of how many kids and adults have been amputated because their wounds could not be treated and have been amputated without anesthetics. So IHL has been distorted to justify a war of annihilation. Israel's genocide of the Palestinian in Gaza is just an escalatory stage of a long-standing settler colonial process of erasure. For over 76 years, this process has suffocated the Palestinians as a people, demographically, culturally, economically, and politically, crushing their inalienable rights to self-determination in an attempt to displace them and expropriate and control their lands. The colonial amnesia of us in the West has condoned Israel, or has served to condone, to condone Israel's crimes and its settler colonial project from the violent history of the very birth of the State of Israel to its oppressive occupation since 1967, the crippling closure of Gaza since 1993, all the wars that have been launched against Gaza, including its last military assault. The world now sees the bitter fruit of the impunity afforded to Israel, and still its, its recalcitrance to stop it, to pedal back and say, let's propose another course of action is astonishing. This was a tragedy foretold. And the ongoing Nakba of the Palestinian people, let's make this word not a taboo. We cannot deny that it happened and continues to happen. This must, stop. This must be stopped and remedied once and for all. While the International Court of Justice will have to deliberate, while the International Criminal Court will have to investigate, it is my responsibility to remind member states, as I've done to the Human Rights Council, that the Genocide Convention includes a use Kogan's norm and erga omnes obligations to prevent the commission of genocide, a reality that the International Court of Justice has already recognized as plausible three months ago, almost. The time for states to act was then, the 26th of January, when the court recognized the plausibility of genocide, and over time, has only delayed its observance to international law, violating it in plain sight. In this darkest hour, the international community cannot continue to ignore that it's Israel's project to rid Palestine of Palestinians in defiance of international law and the world's failure to call Israel to account that has led to the genocide la laid bare in Gaza. So my report wants to be a call, like a wake-up call to the world to ensure that Israel and thir third states adhere to their non-derogable obligations under the Genocide Convention to, protect, to prevent further loss of life and help survivors, all survivors in that land from the river to the sea, to rebuild their lives with dignity and ensure full accountability under both individual criminal and state responsibility. This is the imperative owed to the victims of this highly preventable tragedy and to future generations of Israelis and Palestinians alike. 
Thank you so much.